Hey there, welcome to a new episode of Monday Moments, which is coming out on Tuesday. We apologize for being a little bit behind the curve, but we're bringing it to you nonetheless. If you are new to this show, this show is uh, taking a deeper dive into Sunday's sermon. With me today is Pastor Dennis. Thanks for taking some time out of your day to, to, to dive into your sermon. Thank you for having yeah. me. Absolutely. If you're new to this show, be sure to hit the subscribe button uh, and the little bell icon next to it to be notified every time a new episode is posted. And without further ado, let's jump into it. Let's do it. Yeah. We're continuing our sermon series on the heart of Freedom Fellowship mm-hmm. and the seven non-negotiables, core principles core values um, that sort of make us unique and how we've decided to not only do ministry, but to also do life. Mm-hmm. Um, and what's what we've loved and enjoyed about this sermon series is not just looking at what makes Freedom Fellowship unique, um, but also how these seven principles can be applied to every individual's life. No question about it. They're biblical principles. Right. So it's not unique uh, in any way to Freedom Fellowship. Uh, it's just what rises to the top that makes us uh, yeah. different. Right, exactly. Uh, and this Sunday, you talked about transformation, that um, that non-negotiable core value of transformation and what that looks like. And I think if I had to pick a core verse to refer to, it would be Romans 12 too. Don't Correct. be conformed mm-hmm. to the world or the patterns of the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Yes. Um, one of the questions that I had was kind of this idea of God's grace being sufficient for us. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we're not saved by works, we're saved by grace, um, and that's all that it is. And um, Paul even kind of wrestles with this a little bit in a couple of his his letters. And so my question is, if God's grace is sufficient for us, why is transformation important? Yeah, it sounds... Uh like transformation uh, could be compared to works. Yeah, yeah. Uh, So um, someone might be thinking, if God's grace is sufficient, then why do I have to work so hard at changing? And and that's a great question, uh, because again, transformation, uh, uh, my working definition of transformation, as you've heard, is that transformation is becoming something you are not. Now, if I'm not something and I have no power to become that something, Mm -hmm. that doesn't uh, mean that I still don't desire to change. Uh, I could be a a depressed individual that wants to be happy, that wants to look in the scriptures and see all of the things that talk about the joy of the Lord. I could be a person uh, who has a a terrible issue with lust. And I could say, you know what? Uh, be, because what I see in the scriptures and because what I see in other people, I don't want to struggle with this the way I do. I'm in bondage. Well, th- that's saying I can't change, but I want to. Yeah. So there's a lot of things that in life that I can look at and say, I have no power to become that. But the promise is, is that through the grace of God, I can become that. Yeah. Where my um, effort comes into it is that God is a relational God. Mm. And so he actually desires for me to, to partner with him in this work. Yeah. There are times when God comes in and uniquely does something. How many times have we heard of people uh, who uh, have uh, had an addiction? Uh, they, they're smoking and they come to Christ. They, they smoke cigarettes. They come to Christ and um, they say, Lord, I want to be delivered from this. And they stop and they say, you know, it's amazing. I never struggled. Well, mm. I know a lot of other people that did struggle, but that's a, that's a transformation. And that's God coming in and actually doing something. Right. You know, that's a wonderful, right. miraculous event. It's a small miracle in a lot of people's lives. But if you've had an addiction and you just don't struggle with it anymore, that's amazing. Oh, yeah. But then there's a lot of other people that say, I had to struggle to get there. And they had to go to God on a daily basis, on a, an hourly basis, whatever it is, and and seek the grace of God to continue to go on. That's yeah. been more my experience. Right. You know, So the reason that it's important that we understand transformation as not just a, 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 a miraculous intervention of God, but it's a partnering of God's grace... Yeah with my desire and will to do good. Right, right. Yeah. 
Does that make sense? Absolutely. And it makes me think of the, you know, that, that Greek word for um, transformation in that passage is where we get our word, our English word, metamorphosis. Yes. And yes. it's to become mm-hmm. something new. And I think uh, you've shared it with me is like when we go through salvation and Jesus transforms us in the way that only he can, it's not like we become a better version of ourselves. It's we become an entirely new person. The new, old has gone. Yes, a new creature in Christ. Yeah. That's our new identity right. in Christ. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And and it kind of it makes me think of that verse that says, "Work out your salvation with fear and trembling." It doesn't mean work for your salvation. It just means work out this process, this ongoing, continual process. Um, and even that that Greek word "meta" has this idea of of this kind of ongoing being with. Transform this ongoing process of, of transformation. Yeah, and carry that scripture all the way through. Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, mm-hmm. for it is God mm. who is at work in yeah. you. Listen to these words, both to will and to do for his good pleasure. Yeah. The will is the desire. Right. The do is the power. Yeah. So in transformation, it is God who gives us the desire. That's the Holy Spirit inside of us saying, I want you to be the best that you can possibly be. I, why? So that we represent Christ, mm-hmm. so that we have the essence, the fragrance of Christ around us. That's the desire. Mm. But listen to the next word, the do, yeah. the power. And so much of Christianity today is ignoring the power of God. We are convinced that God is really pleased when we work really hard to change ourselves, And yet the whole point of transformation is, is that I can't. Right. I can't. I can become a better uh, a better person, yeah. but I can't become a new person. Right, right. And that's transformation. Yeah. And I think on the opposite side of that spectrum is, I think the danger can be to think in our minds, um, God's grace is sufficient, therefore I don't need to change my lifestyle. Right, and let's just assume that it's a sinful lifestyle of some kind. Mm-hmm. You know, fill yeah. in the blank. Yeah, and, and it often is. Yeah, what what's the inherent danger in that kind of thinking? Of sloppy agape. Sure. Greasy grace. Greasy grace. Slide into God's yeah. kingdom on God's greasy yeah. grace. It is a it is a complete. Um, I want to use a word that I shouldn't use. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it is it ignores completely hmm. what Jesus did on the cross. Wow. I mean it is the it is the worst kind of lie. Sure. That says that God's grace is there to allow me to remain the same. Hmm. When transformation again and I said it on Sunday morning, transformation was the entire goal yeah. of the gospel. It was God's intention from the sin in the garden all the way through to the cross to transform mankind, yeah. to bring him back to his original intent. Mm. And because of sin, you you know, it's, it's, I've said it before, you know, go, go uh, your plumber dies. Don't bother going to him and saying, you know what? Uh, if you'll just get up uh, one more time and come and fix my faucet, I'll give you new life. Hmm. It's not going to, it doesn't matter. You, yeah. he, you've got to give the one before you get the other. Right. And God came and gave us new life, transformed us right. for a purpose. Right. And that's the whole of the gospel. You know, once again, what you just said, he, but he, he did it he, and he gave us both the will, the desire, yeah. and the power to do his yeah. will. Yeah. Yeah, those that's two good. things. It's good. It's good. Um, what are just some things that might hinder our transformation? I know we kind of talked a little bit about, um, you know, this lack of desire to change or or not seeing that change is necessary and good. But what are some other things that might hinder transformation in our lives? You know, that's a great question, but let's bring it down to two areas that I personally believe, and I don't have... A bunch of chapter and verse. This is, I believe it, you don't have to, okay? okay. This is 
This is the uh, uh, the theology of Dennis Gallagher. Okay? <laughs> but I have come to realize through all of the years that I've served God that the enemy has two basic weapons that he uses against us. Yeah. Only two. Yeah. He was stripped of so much uh, that he had. As you look at the Old Testament, as you look at all of the history that leads up to the Gospels, as you look at all of the demoniacs that mm. Jesus dealt with when he was here on this earth yeah. well, in just a very small dot uh, yeah. of, of ground uh, called Palestine at the time. You know, as you look at it, the, the two weapons that the enemy has to use against us are fear mm. and, and lies. Those two things, fear and lies. Yeah. He makes us afraid and he lies to us. What does he lie to us about? He lies to us about our relationship to the Father. Sure. That's what he does. And so when we're believing those lies, when we're not in the word of God, and we're not saying this is truth, not for someone else, but for me, this, what I'm reading, no matter what it looks like, when I look at the Bible and I see something that is truth, but it's not truth to me, that is called a need for transformation. That's yeah. what it is, becoming something I'm not. Right. So th there's this lie that the enemy has that says that you're not capable right. or you're not uh, good enough or you're not close enough or you're mm -hmm. not doing enough or whatever the lie is, it's a lie. Yeah. And then fear. And how much does he use fear? You know, I, I, I recently... Um, uh, did some traveling. I was traveling overseas, and with all of the coronavirus stuff, uh, we were we were really uh, in a tough spot because we were going into a country that just two days before we went into the country, it completely changed its restrictions on coronavirus. Wow! And we needed to have a COVID a current COVID test, which we went and got, but the results were not ready, and so mm -hmm. consequently. Uh, we, we had people who were waiting for us in that country. They, ha they had to leave the country. When we got on the plane and we were able to get on the plane, but we didn't know what was going to happen when we got off. And I mean, we were, we were uh, anxious about it. We weren't afraid, you know, yeah. but really anxious. So we get off the plane and we go up to passport control uh, in this country. And they look at us and they say, uh, have you had a COVID shot? Yes. Okay. And that was it. We were so concerned about all of the things that weren't going to happen. Mm. And we just looked at, at one another. There was four of us at, at, when we, and when we got on the other side and we just started to laugh. We thought all that anxiety between the four of us worrying about what was going to happen. How often we do that when it comes to the Father's love mm. and the Father's grace yeah. and the Father's kindness and the Father's mercy. Look, I'll be the first to say the one attribute that is not talked about enough when it comes to God, we talk about his loving kindness, uh, his mercy, his grace, uh, his holiness. The one attribute that is not talked about is his patience. Hmm. <laughs> yeah. He's patient. Yep. He's patient. And we're not. Praise God for that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Praise God for that. But when you think of that's the characteristics that he wants me to have too. Yeah. And so what happens when I'm not patient? I'm fearful. Yeah. I'm afraid of what's going to happen instead of saying, you know what? The Lord really does have this under control. Yeah. He really does. And how often does that fear keep us paralyzed from moving forward oh, or yeah. from taking that step and, and the lie? And it's, I say it's funny, it's not funny, but it, it almost is from a certain perspective that, you know, the, that lie, Satan is so crafty in changing the the... The surface level of that lie just a little bit but if you dig down it it goes back all the way to the garden and the lie that satan told adam and eve god is holding out on you he's not really good if god was really good he would allow you to have yeah. this yeah. um and and he twists it ever so much to fit whatever circumstance or situation or temptation or whatever we're going through but it's essentially the same is is god really good it's a whole other topic too for another day. Yeah. But we don't know. Have you ever sat and thought about what would have happened if Adam had said no, mm -hmm. no, Eve, I'm not going there. Yeah. I'm not going there. What would have happened? What would history have looked like? Yeah. 
do you think that God at some point would have released that tree of life yeah. to Adam? Well, I, personally, I, I do. I, I, there was a reason that he was withholding it, that even in his perfection, he was testing in a way Adam's resolve. Mm-hmm. The one tree out of the thousands in the garden, God said, that one's mine, don't touch it. And would he have given it? I, I believe, you know, I mean, talk about theory, you know, we have no idea, but the whole, the whole story would have been dramatically changed. And what was the problem? He didn't wait. He didn't wait. Mm. So the patience of the Lord, when it comes to transformation, never letting go, never believing the lie that says, you know what? I blew it. I messed up. Now God's not going to never believing that lie and never being afraid to say, oh no, I, I didn't measure up. I didn't do it. So God must be fill in the blank, angry with me, disappointed with me. I don't measure up whatever it is. No, those are the two weapons that the enemy has against us, lies and fear. And if you begin to look at all of the great challenges of life, there's a lie and there's a fear. That is the work of the enemy against us. He is not some guy running around in a red suit with a tail and a pitchfork. He is a deceptive, uh, guerrilla warfare oriented being that is set out to destroy the work of God in our lives. Even though he's defeated, he still wants to mess up as much as he can. Fear and lies. One of the cool analogies, it's hard to say analogy because it was a real event, um, but you brought in this imagery of Caesarea Philippi when Jesus took the disciples there and showing them what was culturally referred to in that time as the gates of hell, this bottomless, what seemed to be a bottomless pit um, that... The, the society around them believed was the gates of hell. They had the, the idol worship and all of the detestable sacrifices going on. And there's been a lot of contention around Jesus's phrase when he talks to Peter and says, Peter, on this rock, I will build my church. And people have gone back and forth. Well, was Jesus saying, Peter, you're the rock and on you, I'm going to build the church. Or, you know, am I going to build the church on Jesus? And, and, very well could just be that he was literally talking about that mountain that was over this cave right. and the city on top of it and saying, this is how the kingdom of heaven will be. It will be built on the gates of hell in the midst of darkness and um, depravity and sin and oppression and bondage and whatever else. This is where my kingdom will be established. And out of that very place that was so full of darkness came the Jordan River. And I thought that was just such an amazing glimpse into um, the context and culture of that time. Um, Tell me a little bit more about that and how that applies to us on maybe a personal level. I think it's easy to look at it and say, okay, when you say the church, that's, you know, corporate, I get that. So how, but maybe tell me more about that, that history, that culture, but as, as well as how does that apply on an individual basis. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I think one of the interesting thing is, is that to this day, it's called the gate of hell. Really? Yeah. Yeah. To this day. So it's a, it's a, it's a tourist attraction, basically. I mean, again, uh, most people uh, who go up above Galilee are going because I mean, it's, it's again, it's this lush, uh, you saw the picture, you know, it's just incredible. This, and this flowing stream clear, it's just beautiful. Yeah. And then you walk up and because the uh, the stress on the springs has been much greater, there's no longer a river coming out of that cave, but that was what it was uh, initially. You know, mm. that there was a, a period of time during the year when the river actually flowed out. Uh, so how does it apply? It, was Jesus talking about Peter uh, when he was talking about building uh, the church on that rock? Obviously not a different word, completely different word, and even and and even though you know I'm from the I'm from the background, the Catholic background that said that that was Peter the first apostle and that's what Jesus was talking to. It's it's not it's not it doesn't need to be debunked. It's just not the way you know Petros Peter, 
Petros, solid stone. Hmm. Now, was Jesus referring to himself or to this incredible uh, place, this awful place that he was standing at? I don't know. Hmm. I think that it can be applied both ways. I think that it can be accurately applied both ways. But when you add that element, when you look at this rock that is in front of you and you realize that that is, was called the place, the gate of hell, you realize the only time Jesus ever went to Caesarea Philippi was for that. Mm -hmm. And again, the disciples, the whole, the whole Jewish nation would not go there. There were not synagogues that were located there for Jesus to teach in, hmm. but he brought them there right in front of that place and said, you see, you know the gates of hell. You know what goes on. Look around you. The gates of hell will not stand against because I will build my church on the rock, the rock called Jesus and the rock that's going to be set on top of the rock. Hmm. So how do we apply it in our lives? Until we come to a place where we stop thinking that I can be good enough to satisfy God's grace or that other people can be good enough to satisfy God's grace. In other words, that I can, I can formulate my own human grace. I can become a good enough person. Then I will never understand how much of hell flows out of my life without the grace of God. Yeah. And consequently... Uh, the, the scriptures are very clear, very clear. And it's, and it's not this idea that, you know, that uh, somehow we're all evil to the core. I mean, that, that's not the point. The point is not that we're sinners. The point is that we're alone without God and that God wants to come alongside of us and not just heal our aloneness, but the way that he heals our aloneness is that he, he does away, he pays for that sin mm -hmm. that keeps me alone. Yeah. And so consequently, how do I apply it? You know, personally, myself, <laughs> I knew what was coming out of me. And I knew there was a deep pit, a bottomless pit of sin that I could not somehow fill up with good stuff. Hmm. And that was the whole point of this place called the gates of hell is that they try, they would try to drop, you know, uh, whatever it was, a rock with a rope on it and try to get down to the bottom of it, and they couldn't. So in their view, their idolatrous view, that must be the gate of hell. That's where all of the gods go in the winter, and then they come out in the, in the spring when mm -hmm. things start to green up and such. Well, that bottomless pit was in me. Yeah. And the only thing that could fill it, the only thing that could fill it was the grace of God. That yeah. was it. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. And so, you know, there's so much there. I mean, you could unpackage it. They would throw sacrifices, animal sacrifices into that pit. And it would, and again, the water was very, the water level was very far down below in the winter and it would go all the way down there. And they knew if blood then flew, uh, uh, came out of the streams, they would know that the sacrifice would not be accepted by their demon gods. Mm. Wow. If it didn't come out, then they knew that the sacrifices was accepted by their demon gods. Mm. But guess what? The sacrifice that was thrown into sin produced a rushing river of yeah. eternal blood for yeah. me. And that was acceptable by God. So there's all kinds of things that you yeah. can do with that. Yeah. You know. But the bottom line is, is that uh, there is a there is a a, 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 a a well of sin in every person that cannot possibly be plunged except yeah. by the blood of Jesus. Yeah. yeah. It, it's so, f I love that there's so much imagery there and there's so much intentionality when Jesus decided we're going to go here, mm -hmm. even though there, it, it's like, 
it's so easy to to read that passage and just say, oh yeah, they went to Caesarea Philippi, and then just move on and just right. keep reading. Because there are two Caesarea Philippi's in the Bible. Oh, okay. Yeah, so that's the other thing that you yeah. have to be aware of. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's two. And you kind of jokingly said on Sunday, you know, we forget to consult the book of maps, you know, right, yeah. <laughs> and to really dig into it that yeah. like, oh, Caesarea Philippi. I mean, it's one thing to say, oh, it's, it's here in the countryside, but to really dig even further and say, what was going on? Why did Jesus take them to this place? And to, right. and to really stop and think, Jesus was very intentional. It wasn't happen, you know, ha- haphazard. It wasn't happen chance. No. It, it no. was very intentional, very purposeful. And so what I find very cool about that is not only all of the imagery that we just talked about, but to go back and when you read the scriptures and you read Jesus went here or he went there or he chose to do this or chose to do that it should really encourage us to pause a moment and say i wonder what's going on here that's not explicitly written in the scriptures right right it's, it's so critical to it and that's just expository it's yeah. it's expositing it's taking out of the yeah. scriptures the other thing is is that when you look at that in fact you should write above it in your in your bible graduation ceremony that was the graduation ceremony for the disciples right there yeah. for the apostles wow. That, that was it. Hmm. You know, he was graduating them. Upon this rock, I'll build my church. And now, here's your here's your diploma. Because right after that, it was something we couldn't get to. And I even went long on Sunday morning, but you couldn't get to it. It was, and I give you what? The keys of the kingdom of God. Yeah. That was your diploma right yeah. there. And that we have those keys right now. Yeah, absolutely. Whole other sermon series. What yeah. are the keys of the kingdom? I mean, it's it's incredible. And yet... The lies and the fear of the devil yeah. keep us from believing that those things are for ourselves. Right. And that the kind of transformation that needs to take place in order for me to operate in those things well. Yeah. You know? Yeah. I, I don't give a sports car to a 16 year old. I did in the past and it did not go well. <laughs> <laughs> Why? Because it's too much. Yeah. And God wants us to grow up, be transformed in order that we can properly use the keys of the kingdom throughout our life. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I wish we had a lot more time to dive into this because there's, like you said, there's so much imagery and um, analysis and comparison that can be made out of that one simple little passage, whether it's yeah. Jesus, the perfect sacrifice. You know, the Bible even says he descended into the lower parts of the yes. earth and yeah. out of us come these streams of living water, yeah. you know, um, yeah. the, the church globally, you know, being established even when in the midst of darkness, you know, the Bible says we shine like stars in set in a black sky, you know, in the night. So there's just so much there that we could continue to talk about. So, yeah. but I appreciate you taking some time out of your day to dive into uh, Sunday's sermon. So it was very good. If you haven't had a chance to watch that, you can do so on our YouTube channel right here, or you can go to our website and view it there. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Monday Moments. Again, if you haven't subscribed to our channel yet, do so um, and hit the little bell icon. That way you can be notified every time a new episode is posted. Thank you so much again for joining us, and we will see you next week.